Good morning. Welcome back. Um, ah, so the Red Sox won. That's pretty convincing. Yeah, very good. Yay, Red Sox. Um, so, um, as you can also tell, I, I have something of a cold, so I will uh, see if I make it, my voice makes it through. But what I wanted to do today, <coughs> if the voice allows, was to talk about genomics. Now, this is a little bit different than uh, what we normally do in the class because I work on genomics. It's something I, I'm extremely interested in. And so what I wanted to do today, and I'll do it one more time near the end of the, the uh, term, is to talk about research that's going on in genomics, give you a sense of what's really going on. I can assure you that almost nothing I say will be in the textbook or any other textbook. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how this might appear on an exam, so don't ask, because I'm going to really just talk about research that's going on today. And part of the purpose of doing that is to, A, show you that it's possible for you to understand the kind of research that's going on in this field, and B, I hope to excite you about what's going on in this field. So each year I pick different things to talk about, and I've picked a few things, and we'll see. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions and all that. Uh, but this is very much more uh, sort of the edge of genomics, including stuff that's going on, you know, right now as we speak. So we'll fire away. So a little introductory stuff. I've called this, and we can actually leave the lights up. I think people, can people read that? Yeah, it's fine. Good. So we'll leave the lights up so I can see people. Um, <clears throat> So I think the thing that sets apart this revolution in biology that we're living through right now is the transformation of biology, not just from being a you know, study of living organisms to the study of chemicals and enzymes to the study of molecules, but to the study of biology as information. That is what's distinctive about this decade, is the idea that the information sciences have begun to merge with biology, uh, or biology merged with the information sciences, and that it's having a profound effect on driving biomedicine. In both of the two talks I'll give, this one and near the end of the term, that will be the common theme, because I think that's the most important uh, thing that's going on right now. Now, just to remind you, of course, the idea that biology is about information is an old one. It goes back to my hero, Gregor Mendel, with the recognition that information was passed from parent to offspring according to rules. And as you know, the, the history of, of biology in the 20th century can be read as the development of that idea of biology's information. The first quarter of the 20th century, the development of the idea that the information lives in chromosomes. The next quarter of the 20th century, the idea that the information in the chromosomes resides in the DNA double helix and that information was contained in this molecule and somehow in its sequence. And you know all this. In the next quarter of the 20th century, basically from about 1950 to 1975, understanding how it is that the cell reads out that information from DNA to RNA to protein, how it uses a genetic code to translate RNAs into proteins, and the development of the tools of recombinant DNA that made it possible for us to read out the information that the cell reads out. So that brought us three quarters of the way through the 20th century with the ability to read out genetic information, at least in little ways. But they were little ways. You could write a PhD thesis around that time uh, for sequencing 200 letters of DNA. That would be you know, considered an amazingly exciting PhD thesis. The next quarter of the 20th century, the last quarter of the 20th century, was characterized by a voracious appetite to read as much of this information as possible. It started first with trying to read out the sequence of individual genes, then sets of genes, then of genomes of small organisms, bacteria, medium-sized organisms, and then, in a wonderful closure to the 20th century, the reading out of the nearly complete genetic information of the human being in the closing weeks of the 20th century. When you remember that, that um, Mendel was rediscovered in January of 1900, 
that's when the papers Rediscovering Mendel came out. And you, you figure you've got almost perfect bookends from the rediscovery of Mendel in January 1900 to the sequencing of the human genome in around 2000. You realize what a century can do. It's not bad as centuries go, you know, to accomplish all that. And because, I mean, you know, as students, you get a point estimate in time of what science knows. But you guys aren't old enough yet and haven't lived long enough yet to measure the derivative and see how rapidly it's changing. But just look at what happened over the course of that century and then just project forward to what that could mean for the next century. So what it's done is it's brought us to this picture. I have a picture in my head of biology as a vast library of information, a library of information in which evolution has been taking patient notes. Evolution is a very good experimentalist and it's a very patient note taker. Its notes, of course, are written in the genomes. And uh, every day, evolution wakes up, changes a few nucleotides, sees how the organism works. If uh, it was an improvement, evolution keeps the notes. If it was uh, disadvantageous, evolution discards the notes. That, by the way, for those of you working in labs, is no longer considered appropriate laboratory practice. You're obliged to keep your laboratory notes from failed experiments as well. But evolution got into this before those rules were codified. And so it discards the notes from unsuccessful experiments and keeps the notes from the successful experiments. But nonetheless, we have all the notes from the successful experiments. And uh, we can learn a tremendous amount from them. There's a volume on that shelf corresponding to each species on the planet. There's a volume on the shelf corresponding to each individual within each species, to each tissue within each individual within each species. And there's information there about the DNA sequence, about the RNA readouts, about the protein expression levels. And in principle, even if not quite yet in practice, we could pull down any volume we want and interrogate it and compare it for related species, for individuals within a species, some of whom might have a disease, some of whom might not, for different kinds of tissues treated in different ways. That is, I think, going to be a tremendous theme of biology going forward. And that's why it's a particular pleasure to teach biology at MIT, where you guys understand what that could mean, that fusion could mean. Now, this idea of extracting genomic information in large scale is a relatively new one. In the mid-1980s, the scientific community began debating what was a pretty radical idea, sequencing the human genome. Uh, this was floated in a couple of places in 1984. At one meeting, somebody raised the idea. Uh, you've got to realize that, that sequencing itself, the idea of sequencing DNA, only came from the late 70s. So within six, seven years of being able to sequence anything, people were now saying, let's sequence everything. That was a reasonably audacious thing to do. And it was controversial. Um, there were many people who felt that the Human Genome Project was a terrible idea. And with good reason, because the initial version of the Human Genome Project was kind of a blunderbuss approach. It was, let's immediately mount a massive factory and start sequencing the human genome with the just horrible technologies of the mid-'80s, uh, with radioactive sequencing gels and, you know, lots and lots of people doing stuff. And so, uh, it, you know, indeed, many people in science were, con were concerned that an entire generation of students would have to be chained to the bench sequencing DNA. Sidney Brenner, a uh, great molecular biologist, proposed the whole thing be done in penal institutions because, uh, and, you know, people could be sentenced to 20 million bases with time off for accuracy or things like that. Um, and so what happened was the scientific community came together well in, in its best form. Um, group, a group was put together by the National Academy of Sciences who said, well, look, this is a really good idea, but we also need a carefully thought through program to do it. We need intermediate goals that will get us things that advance the science along the way. We need to improve the technologies and laid out a plan. The goals of that plan, develop a genetic map, a map showing the locations of DNA polymorphism, sites of variation, genetic markers, just like Sturdivant did with fruit flies, but to do it with humans and with DNA sequence differences to be used to trace inheritance, that that, that genetic map could be used to map human diseases. And if all you accomplished was got a genetic map of the human being, that would be a good thing. Then you could get a physical map of the human being, all the pieces of DNA overlapping each other, so that you would know if you had a genetic marker linked to cystic fibrosis, you would be able to get the piece of DNA that contains the gene. Then if we managed to pull that off, we could get a sequence of the human genome, all three billion nucleotides 
on, on the web so that you could just go to any place in the genome, double click, and up would pop the sequence. Now, you guys, of course, don't laugh at that, but about eight years ago, when I would give talks about this, I would speak about, oh, and you'll be able to go double click and up will pop the sequence. And of course, everybody thought that was really funny, and that was, that was something people laughed at. But of course, you can just do that today. If anybody has a wireless, you can just double click and up will pop the sequence. Um, and then, of course, a complete inventory of all the genes within that sequence. And very importantly, and from the very beginning, the notion that all this information should be completely freely available to anybody regardless of where they were, whether in academia or industry, in, in first world countries, third world countries, that everybody should have free and un, unrestricted access to that information. So a plan was laid out. I won't go into these details here, but the plan was laid out that involved work in constructing genetic maps, physical maps, sequence maps in the human and the mouse, in some model organisms, including the bacteria, yeast, fruit flies, worms, and uh, quite remarkably, it largely went according to plan. Over the course of about 15 years, a lot of people in the scientific community came together and took up different tasks. Um, I should say with some pride that MIT was, was uh, by far one of the leading contributors to this whole effort, having been involved in essentially every stage of this, the genetic mapping of human and mouse, the physical mapping of human and mouse, and the sequencing of human and mouse, and having been the leading contributor to that, that latter. And it's not an accident, because MIT is a marvelous environment in which to undertake this kind of research. It involved changing the way we do biology. Back in the mid-'80s, when we sequenced DNA, we did it with radioactivity. Remember when I taught you how to sequence, I said you could use a radioactive label and a gel and all that. That's how we did it. You stood behind this plastic shield and you loaded the gels. And of course, now it's done in a highly automated fashion. This is the production floor at the Broad Institute, which is here on, on MIT, where robots prepare all the DNA samples. So E. coli uh, grown up. And then you have to crack open the cells, purify the DNA, purify the, purify the plasmid, uh, do a sequencing reaction, et cetera, et cetera. It's all done robotically there. And this is capable of processing and does process in a given day about 200,000 samples per day. They then go, have, and this is all equipment designed by people here at MIT and then commercially built for us. Um, they then go to the back room where actually these are the previous generation of DNA sequencers, commercial detectors, those those capillary detectors that have the little lasers on them. There's a whole farm of them that sit there and are able to get data out. And in the course of a single day, we can now generate about 40 billion bases, of, uh, sorry, in the course of a single year, we can generate about a 40 billion bases of DNA sequence. The Genome Project itself was a collaboration involving 20 different groups around the world, groups in the United States, the United Kingdom, and France, and Germany, and Japan, and China. They were of different sizes, different, they used different approaches, uh, but everybody was committed to one common cause of producing this information and making it freely available, and uh, everybody worked together. And for the rest of my life, when it comes to Friday at 11 o'clock, I will always, you know, think Genome Project, because we had a weekly conference call uh, of all the groups in the world working on this Fridays at 11. Uh, and it was a fascinating experience over the course of many, many years for that. So a draft sequence, a rough draft sequence of the human genome was published in the year, in, in February of 2001. It was announced with some fanfare in June of 2000. Um, but uh, the real scientific paper came out in February of 2001. This was not a perfect sequence of the human genome by any means. This covered about 90% of the sequence of the human genome. It still had about 150,000 gaps in it. It had errors. But it still did have about 90% of the sequence of the human genome. For the next three years, people worked very hard. And as of last April, a finished sequence of the human genome was produced and was published a couple weeks ago. And it contains, our best guess, about 99.3% of the human genome. And it still has about 343 gaps. They're, you know, we know where they are. We know what they are. But, but they're not sequenceable with current technologies. That's the, quote, finished human genome. What is it like? Well, this is a picture of a genome. Do we have a pointer? Let's see here. We do have a pointer. Uh, this is your genome here. This is chromosome number 11. And I'll call attention to some interesting bits. So these colored lines here represent genes or gene predictions based on uh, both sequencing of cDNAs and mapping them back to the genome as well as computer programs that analyze the genome. And uh, they're, they're, right here you have a big pile up, lots of genes. Very few genes over here. Lots of genes and few genes. 
Notice that the places where there are lots of genes match up with, the, with these light gray bands, which are the light gray bands in the microscope on chromosomes. The places with very few genes match up with the dark bands in the chromosome. Now, do you know why that is, that the gene-rich regions are these chromosome light bands and the gene-poor regions are the chromosome dark bands? Me neither. Nobody, nobody has a clue. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, it's just one of these things. We had no reason to expect that we'd see these striking patterns. And other genomes, E. coli, doesn't have this dense urban cluster and these big rural plains that are gene poor. This is, this is very weird. Um, and it's distinctive to mammals. Uh, you'll also notice that the gene-rich regions here are rich in Gs and Cs. They have different distributions of some repeat elements. There's all sorts of weirdness that just comes from looking at the genome. The biggest weirdness was the number of genes. The count of genes is our best guess, about 22,500 genes. If I had to pick a number today, it would be our count of genes. And of course, that's down from the 100,000 that was in some textbooks, and it's down even from the 30 to 40,000 that was in the genome paper of February of 2001. Our best guess is that it's really just about that range. Now, the genes themselves are very interesting. When you look at, you know, if, if we only have 22,000 genes, you know, what do we, how do we manage to, to run a human being with so few genes? It is, by the way, probably fewer genes than the mustard weed Arabidopsis thaliana has. So what do we do? Well, humans, uh, one, one thing we may take comfort in is that we, although we only have about 22,000 genes, there's a lot of alternative splicing. And on average, a typical gene, on average, has about two alternative splice products. Some have many, some have few. But probably, when you're all done, those 22,000 genes may encode 70, 80,000 different proteins. And it could be more than that, because we don't know all the alternative splice products and, and what they do. Uh, but if you ask, are, you know, are, can humans get credit for being uh, really inventive or creative, for having lots of new genes that make us human? The answer is no. Not only are humans not different in their gene complement from other mammals, mammals as a group really haven't invented that much when you get down to it. Most of the recognizable subdomains of proteins, proteins are built up of subdomains, recognizable sequences that have certain motifs that fold up in certain ways or carry out certain enzymatic functions. And it looks like our genomes, our genes, are mix and match combinations of many domains that were invented a long time ago in invertebrates and before, and that most of evolutionary innovation in the more complex multicellular animals has simply been mixing and matching these, these domains in new ways to get slightly different functions. You don't get a lot of points for creativity, but it does seem to work. Now, by far the most derivative of all, and what characterizes our genome tremendously, is when a gene works, make extra copies of it and let it diverge slightly and take up new functions. Really, your genome is just characterized by large expansions of families, immunoglobulin-like genes, intermediate filament proteins holding together the cytoskeleton. There are 111 different keratin-like genes in your genome. They're all different. They do different things. But they all came from one gene that was copied, copied, copied at random, randomly duplicated, and then diverged to take up new functions. Uh, growth factors. Flies and worms manage to get by just fine, thank you, with two growth factors of the TGF beta class, whatever that is. You have 42 growth factors of this TGF beta class, all of which help communicate, cells communicate in different ways. And then, of course, olfactory receptors. Uh, in your genome, you have about a thousand genes for olfactory, for smell receptors. This is what uh, Richard Axel and Linda Buck won a Nobel Prize for uh, this year was their work on olfactory receptors. Um, sad to say, though, out of your 1,000 olfactory receptors, genes, most of them are broken. They're mostly pseudogenes. Um, it's not true in dogs and mice who keep their olfactory receptor genes in pretty fine working order. But it's very clear that in primates with color vision, our olfactory receptor genes have been going to seed. They have been piling up mutations, and there's no selective pressure to keep many of them. And in fact, we've now shown in a paper that will come out soon that this process is accelerating dramatically in the last 7 million years since we diverged from chimps. And so humans have almost completely lost interest in smell. That's not totally true. Some of these olfactory receptors surely matter for various processes, but most of them are probably irrelevant right now. Um, 
And so, anyway, that's, that's the nature of the genes there. Another interesting fact that's worth mentioning about your genome is half of your genome consists of transposable elements, elements that simply duplicate themselves and hop around the genome, elements that are like viruses. They make a copy, sometimes into RNA. The RNA is copied back into DNA and slammed elsewhere in your genome. Uh, these elements, well, the, there are four classes, alu elements, uh, line elements, retrovirus-like elements. All of these go through RNA intermediates and use reverse transcription. And then there's certain DNA transposons that go through a DNA intermediate. The number of copies of the alu element, the alu element that, that's hopped around your genome, is about a million. You have a million fossils of this element that's hopping. You say, why is it there? And the answer is, because it's there. Because anything that knows how to make a copy of itself and insert itself in your genome, you can't get rid of. You could consider it, if you wish, an infection. But half of your genome consists of an infection with these kinds of transposable elements. Now, that said, yes? Well, it's very interesting. Um, what's the effect? Well, they do, some of them are transcribed. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. Sometimes it's bad. One of them will hop into a gene and mutate it, and that's bad, and that, that person will have a lethal mutation. But uh, the genome has probably begun to use them and, and, and uh, count on their being there. So when a bunch, when a transposable one goes in and it creates a spacing, if you, if, for example, if, a, if an engineering committee came in and cleaned up the genome by getting rid of all the transposable elements, it would surely not work because we have evolutionarily come to count on the spacing there. Sort of like if, if in, your, uh, in some very um, messy attic, you put a cup of coffee down on top of a stack of papers. Those papers may be utterly irrelevant, but now they're holding up that cup of coffee that you've put down on it. And if, and if you were to just poof, magically get rid of them, the cup of coffee would come crashing to the ground. So, you know, it, they, they're just there taking up space. Now, sometimes even more than that, a few of them have actually been co-opted into being human genes. We know that a few of these transposable elements have mutated into being our genes that do something for us. And others of them may do things in affecting the general neighborhood with regard to transcription. And so instead of it being a parasite, think of them as a symbiont, that it's a genomic symbiont, which takes some advantage of us, and we may you know, have worked out a compromise to take some advantage of it. Every time a copy is made of these and it hops in the genome, some mutations may happen in the, in the master element, but when it lands in the new place, we have a record of that hop. And if you reconstruct the sequence of the million alu elements, you can see which ones are very close relatives of each other and had to have hop hopped recently, and which ones are somewhat more distant relatives and more distant relatives. And you can build an evolutionary tree connecting all of the repeat elements that have hopped around your genome and thereby attach a date to each of them as to when they hopped. So it really is a fossil record. And you can figure out how many have been hopping at different times over history. And we can even make a plot of that. This is long ago. Sometime here, uh, some 30 million years ago, there was a huge explosion in, in our transposons in our genome. We don't know why that happened, but it's very interesting. It does correspond to very interesting periods in primate evolution. And then, interestingly, there's been a huge crash. And transposition has dropped dramatically. We have no clue why this is. But we have a whole fossil record here of the rate of transposition of different kinds of repeat elements around our genome, and people are now trying to figure out what in the world this means. So all this is sort of there inherent in the sequence. And if you want the sequence, as I say, you can go to the web and pull all this stuff down. So uh, now how do, we, how do we understand this sequence? Well, I've told you a little bit about it from the, the simple things that we've done, but there's a lot more that needs to be learned about this sequence. And so what I really want to turn to is how we're extracting information out of this sequence. So DNA sequence is long and boring. It's only marginally more interesting than reading your hard disk because it has four letters instead of ones and zeros. But it's, you know, it's really pretty boring if you take a look at it. How do you attach meaning to all this stuff? One of the most powerful ways is by comparison with other genomes. And so comparing the human genome to the mouse genome is very informative in many ways. So as soon as the human genome was far along, 
uh, a portion of the international consortium set to work getting a sequence of the mouse genome, and that was published in December of 2002. We have a nice map of the mouse genome with all these things. It, too, shows these gene-rich regions, gene-poor regions, all sorts of funny things. And if we look closely at a portion of the human genome over here, I've picked about a million bases of the human genome. And we take any little spot in that million bases of the human genome, let's say over here, and we take out the DNA sequence corresponding to this spot, and we run it in the computer against the mouse genome and ask, where in the mouse genome do we get the best match to this? The best match to this is here. Now let's do it for this piece here. The best match anywhere in the mouse genome lands in the same million bases here of the mouse genome. In fact, for every single sequence that we pull out from this million bases of the human genome, the best match is in this, is in this million bases of the mouse genome. That's very interesting. Why is that? Sorry? No, people do know. And this it was a good, good try, though. Um, <laughs> This million bases of the mouse genome and this million bases of the human genome represent the evolutionary descendants of a common million bases that occurred in our common ancestor 75 million years ago. This is a clear evidence of the evolution here because we can see this is a segment of DNA from our common ancestor that really hasn't undergone much rearrangement. And we can just line up the sequences and see. In fact, we can build a whole map across the mouse genome like this. For any bit of the mouse genome, I don't know, here's a bit on mouse chromosome number 17. This whole stretch corresponds to a portion of human chromosome number 8. This stretch here, I don't know, there's a, this green color here on chromosome number 6 corresponds to chromosome 4 in the human. And so we can build a lookup table that says for any portion of the human genome, what's the corresponding portion of the mouse genome that came from the same ancestor and has basically the same complement of genes in it? And then only it's about 330 such regions that we need to cut and paste the human genome order into the mouse genome order, roughly speaking. There's a lot of little local rearrangements, but at this gross level. So now if we go back more closely and we look at this, we say, okay, so now we look at this region. We now know these two regions descend from a common ancestor. If we do a careful evolutionary analysis, lining up all the sequences and see how well preserved the sequences are, some are much better preserved than others. Evolution has been much more lovingly conserving certain sequences than others. And so let's, let's now zoom in on a gene. This is a gene that goes by the name PPAR gamma. I'm fond of this gene, but no, it doesn't matter. Uh, if we look, I've indicated all the regions here in which there's a high degree of conservation. The sequence is well conserved here, 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 and here, 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 here. These ones correspond to the exons of the PPAR gamma gene. They encode the protein of the gene. And the, old, the splicing goes like this. Okay? These things here do not correspond to the exons. People have no idea what they are. In fact, this is not supposed to be here. Uh, the official textbook picture says the vast majority of what matters for a gene, what evolution should preserve, is the exons plus the promoter. Here's the promoter. But in fact, what we found is an awful lot more is being preserved. In fact, across the genome, our best estimate is there are about 500,000 conserved elements across the genome, and only a third of them are protein-coding exons. That means two-thirds of the stuff evolution has been interested in is not protein-coding exons, and the truth is we do not know what it is. This was a very radical finding when this mouse paper came out about a year and a half, about two years ago now. Uh, what it must be, I think, but we're guessing, are regulatory signals, structural elements in chromosomes, RNA genes, but there's an awful lot more of it than we had imagined. And we've now, we're in this fascinating situation where computational analysis has told us what's on evolution's mind, and now we have to go to the lab and figure out what in the world it does. But there's no doubt that it must do something because evolution has preserved it quite well. Now, I oversimplified greatly in this discussion. Um, let me first say, then I'll come back to that. We do know that if we take some of those elements, here's one. There's a 401 base pair element that's 84% identical between human and mouse. You could write yourself a little statistical model to say that's way unusual to have something so well preserved. When Eddie Rubin and his colleagues in Berkeley made a knockout mouse that deleted that segment, this knockout mouse loses regulation of three different genes in the neighborhood. 
saying that this must be a regulatory sequence that affects multiple genes in the neighborhood. That's good. That's one. There's about 300,000 such elements to go uh, in order to attach meaning to them. And so doing this entirely by knocking out mice will be a slow process. One's going to need other ways to be able to attach meaning. But uh, there's no doubt. Now, there's some other interesting papers where people have knocked some of these things out, and they've seen no effect on the mouse. They get a totally viable mouse. Can you conclude from that that they have no function? Why not? The knockout mouse is viable. Could be redundant. Could, be redundant. could even not be redundant. Yes, yeah, so it could be redundant, but you couldn't knock out both of two things. It turns out, suppose knocking it out affected the mouse's viability by one part in 10 to the third. It was only 99.9% .9 as fertile. Would you be able to see that in the laboratory? No. Would that matter to evolution? It would be lethal in an evolutionary sense. Such a mutation could never propagate through the population. One part in 10 to the third is massive selection against from an evolutionary point of view, but almost undetectable at the laboratory bench. Evolution has a far more sensitive assay than we do. Now, I, I won't go into detail, but for the mathematically inclined here, showing that there really were uh, about 5% of the human genome under, under evolutionary selection was a complicated affair, because with only two genomes, what we really had to do, and if this doesn't make sense, ignore it, we looked at the background distribution of conservation in the genome in unimportant elements, in those repeat elements that we knew to be uh, functionally broken. We looked at the overall conservation in the genome and found that the overall genome had this rightward tail by subtracting the distributions, we were able to see how much excess conservation there was. That's because we only had two genomes. We had to draw inferences. If we had more genomes, like the mouse and the rat and the dog and the this and the that, we would be able to extract signal from noise. We would be able to see right away which bits were well conserved, and we wouldn't have to do this as a sensitive statistical analysis. So in fact, we need more mammalian genomes. So, so Right now, there's been a sequence of the rat genome in the past year or so. There is a sequence of the dog genome. We're writing up that paper now, uh, but it's on the web already. There's a sequence of the chimpanzee genome. We're writing up a paper on that. This is in collaboration with our friends in the, in the genome sequencing community. We're currently sequencing a variety of other organisms as well. And if you had enough organisms, you ought to just be able to line it up and say, what is evolution preserved, and figure out exactly which nucleotides matter and which nucleotides don't are allowed to drift freely at the background rate. How far could you go with this? Well, we decided to try an interesting experiment. We said, since, since mammals are very big and we're going to need a lot of genome sequence, how about we try a small organism like yeast? What if we were to try to do this, this kind of evolutionary genomic analysis on something like the yeast genome? And so this is work that I'll describe that was between uh, a bunch of people here at MIT who do genome sequencing and a student in computer science, Manolis Kellys, who was a PhD student in computer science. He's now just joined the faculty here at MIT in computer science. Uh, but it was a really great example of how biology and computer science could come together. So the genome sequencing folks sequenced Three related species to our friend the baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, workhorse of geneticists. These three different species are separated by different evolutionary distances from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, when you line up their genomes, just like with human and mouse, you find the genes occur largely in the same order. And, uh, you know, it's not hard to pick out that, oh, yeah, there's this gene there, there you know, it's, this is all lined up. You get these evolutionary segments, and very few rearrangements have occurred across these species, despite the fact that they're about 20 million years apart in the extreme. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. When the yeast genome, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, was first published in 1995, the paper describing it reported 6,200 genes. Now, how did they know there were 6,200 genes? They ran a computer program looking for open reading frames. Any open reading frame, consecutive codons without a stop that was sufficiently long, was called a gene. But statistically, you could, by chance, just have a long stretch of codons without a stop codon. And so 
if I saw 100 codons in a row without a stop, they called it a gene, but it might just be chance. And they knew that, of course. They wrote that in the paper. But for many years, people then had 6,200 open reading frames, which were the yeast genes. Could evolution now tell us which of them were real and which weren't? Well, it turns out evolution was tremendously powerful at doing that. If you take something that's a well-known gene that has been extensively studied by yeast geneticists and you line it up across all four species, you almost never see deletions. And when you do see deletions here in gray, they're always a multiple of three. Why are they a multiple of three? They preserve the reading frame. By contrast, if I take some clear intergenic DNA that's not protein coding, and I compare it across the four species, I see lots and lots of frame-shifting deletions that occur. Evolution tolerates frame-shifting deletions. And if I just write down the rates, frame-shifting deletions are 75 times more common in intergenic DNA than genic DNA. This provides a very powerful test. Run this test across the genome, looking for the density of frame-shifting deletions. Any place that doesn't tolerate frame-shifting deletions is probably a real gene. Anything that does tolerate it is probably not. When you sorted through all this, it turned out that 528 of the official yeast genes were clearly not, open, not real genes. They were just chock-a-block full of these frame-shifting deletions. And the, and, but a bunch of others could be confirmed. And so the yeast gene count, and I won't tell you all the experimental and other evidence that shows that this, this is right, but the yeast genome has now been revised downward to 5,700 genes, and we have great confidence that almost all of those are real genes. There are about 20 at the margins that we're not sure of out of that. And new genes could be found in this way, and uh, here is a really audacious thing. The, the, this, this graduate student in computer science said, I think, based on these other species, there was a mistake made in the sequencing of the first yeast, and that the reason these things are called two separate genes is that somebody made a sequencing error that got a stop code on here, but I think these are really part of just one gene. And so somebody went back and resequenced some of these, and sure enough, he had correctly predicted that there had been a mistake made at that letter, and that these were, in fact, a single gene. The computational analysis was incredibly powerful in this regard. Now, you can go further than this. You could ask, could I also figure out the way genes are regulated in this fashion? Could I work out the intergenic signals in the promoter regions? Remember that LAC repressor binds to a certain operator site? Well, all of these regulatory proteins bind to different sequences. Could we figure out what the sequences were computationally? Well, if we look closely at a genic, an intergenic region, here's one where there are two genes being transcribed in opposite directions, GAL1 and GAL10, both involved in galactose metabolism. And there's a particular protein, a, a transcription factor here called GAL4 that binds in this region. And it has a particular sequence that it likes, CCG, 11 bases, GGC. So that GAL4 site we see is very well preserved across all of the species. So a known regulatory sequence is well-preserved. In fact, let's look at this closely. This GAL4 binding site is a measly, crummy six nucleotides of information. At random, it's going to occur many places in the yeast genome, but not be a real important GAL4 site. Right? Some of them matter, some of them don't. How do we figure out which of these occurrences are real GAL4 sites? Well, if we look across all four species, what we find is that those occurrences that occur in promoter regions are much more likely to be conserved by evolution than those that don't. So there's a special property here, conservation of the motif in promoter regions. In fact, this particular sequence is four times more likely to be preserved when it occurs in a promoter region than when it occurs in a coding region. And for a typical control region, the opposite is true. Since genes, since coding sequences are better preserved in general, for a randomly chosen sequence, I don't know, A, T, G, G, C, A, T, it's more likely to be preserved in, in coding regions than non-coding regions. So this GAL4 motif has a very funky property that on average it's 12 times more likely than background 
to be preserved when it occurs in a promoter. Now, that's a test you could apply to another motif and another motif. In fact, you could, by computer, test all possible motifs and ask which ones have that property. Take make a scatter plot. Most motifs are better conserved when they occur in coding regions than promoter regions. Some, however, are better preserved in promoter regions than in coding regions. Our friend Gal4 is up there, but there are a lot more things like it that are better preserved by evolution in promoters. You can make a list of them. You can get about 72 well-conserved regulatory motifs. And it turns out that 20 years of yeast work produced knowledge about things like the GAL4 site and other sites. Almost all the known regulatory sites that had been discovered over the course of 20 years through experimental work appear on this list that falls out of the computer analysis of evolutionary comparison of genomes. You can actually go a step further. I'll hesitate to tell you, but I'll try anyway. If you wanted to find out, without knowing in advance, what these motifs were doing, what their biological function was, you can do that informationally, too. It turns out that if I take my motif, GAL4, and I ask, which genes does it occur in front of? Well, across Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you find this crummy little motif in many, many places, because as I said, most of this is just noise. But if I ask, which genes have this motif in all four species? These genes. There's a huge overlap with the class of genes involved in carbohydrate metabolism. So if I didn't know in advance that the GAL4 motif was involved in regulating genes in carbohydrate metabolism, I could tell just from the fact that the genes that had conserved it are genes involved in carbohydrate metabolism. You can do that using all sorts of tricks, expression of genes, protein mass spec, blah, 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 blah. And the short answer is, for almost all of those motifs that you can find in the computer, by consulting public databases of sets of genes that are co-expressed or have similar properties and all that, the computer can also offer you a pretty good hypothesis about what that most motif is associated with. You can even go a step further than that. You can begin to look at pairs of motifs. You can say, if I have a certain regulatory sequence, and a s number one, and another regulatory sequence, number two, do they tend to be preserved in front of the same genes as each other? Is, or is their conservation correlated? And you can build a map of these two guys tend, to, when this guy's correlated, this guy tends to be correlated. And this guy, and you can say, oh, those proteins must be talking to each other. And you can read that off from the pattern of evolution as well. There are two regulators, one called Sterol 12, one called Tech 1. This computational analysis shows that they tend to co-occur in a conserved fashion far more often than you would expect by chance. And when you do the analysis, you find that those genes that just have a conserved sterile 12, those genes tend to be involved in mating. Genes that just have a conserved instance of Tech one tend to be involved in the budding of the yeast. And those genes that have conserved occurrences of both tend to be involved in filamentation. Now, all that can be read out, which is way cool. This is not the way we used to do biology. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a ton of experiments that underlay creating these databases. And there's a ton of experiments that have to be done to check any of these things. But what we have is one of the most powerful hypothesis generators that's ever been seen here. Evolution, by telling us what to focus on, is giving us on a silver platter hundreds of hypotheses about who's interacting with whom and sending us back to the lab then to, to test these hypotheses. Now, what are the implications of all of this for the human genome? Could we do this for the human genome? Well, these species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Paradoxus, Macatai, Bionis, are they a good model for mammals? Well, it turns out that their evolutionary distance from each other is the same as the distance of human to lemur to dog to mouse. So they were chosen a purpose. Those actually are fairly good models for the human. So could we do exactly the same analysis for the human, for the entire human genome, if we had 
human, lemur, dog, and mouse are basically four species, human, mouse, rat, and dog. Well, there's one little fly in the ointment. The human genome is 20 times bigger than the yeast genome. If I want to analyze the whole human genome, I have a problem of signal to noise. The genome's 20 times bigger. I got 20 times as much noise to get rid of. I won't walk you through it, but I need more evolutionary information to get rid of all that noise. And you can do a simple calculation that says my evolutionary tree needs to be bigger. Its branch length needs to be bigger by about the natural log of 20 to get rid of 20-fold more noise. And uh, that would mean I need more species. I need about 16 species or something like that to be able to do that. But if I built an evolutionary tree that had a branch length of four, that is four substitutions per base across this evolutionary tree, as indicated by these colored lines here, I should have enough power to analyze the entire human genome the way we just did the yeast genome. So we currently have human, chimp, mouse, rat, dog. As of this fall, during, in fact, right at the beginning of, of this term, the National Institutes of Health signed off on sequencing of these additional eight mammals. These mammals are now in process. And in fact, the elephant is done, and the armadillo is in process, and the tree shrew is being caught, I think, at the moment. We have the ten, <laughs> the ten rec, the, don't, don't talk about the tree shrews, anyway. Uh, the ten rec is, is uh, actually being tested right now, et cetera. And all this is going on right now as we speak. And I think that by next summer, we should have much of, and by certainly next, by about a year from now, we should have almost all of this information to do such an analysis. Now, that said, we're, of course, you know, very impatient people. You could just take the human, the mouse, the rat, and the dog. And I said, that's not enough if you wanted to analyze the whole genome. But suppose you just wanted to analyze a portion of the genome, maybe about a yeast-sized piece of the genome. Well, let's see, you've got 20,000 genes. I don't know, suppose I take, I don't know, two kilobases around each of 20,000 genes. Well, that's, you know, 40 megabases of DNA. It's only a couple-fold more than yeast. Maybe if I just focused on a limited region around each promoter, I could start reading out these regulatory signals with just four species. So in fact, a postdoctoral fellow is, has been working on this problem over the summer, and, uh, and a little bit from the spring, the summer, uh, together with, with Manolis Kellys, who's now in the computer science department. And uh, I think we have a preliminary list for the human genome that's fallen out over the course of the past couple of months. And we're in the process right now of finishing up a paper that we're hoping to get submitted by Friday with a preliminary list of the regulatory signals in the human genome read out from evolution of human, mouse, rat, and dog. It won't be everything. We don't have full power to pick up all possible signals. But we're picking up a lot of the signals. We're picking up a very large fraction of previously discovered signals and lots more new signals as well are falling out of that analysis. So anyway, I can assure you that that's not in the textbooks because it actually hasn't been submitted yet. Um, this other stuff I've described about the yeast analyses, uh, this, if you do want to look it up, there was a paper in Nature about a year and change ago, Kellis et al. Uh, describes this yeast work. This is what's going on. Um, this is what's fun about teaching at MIT is I can tell you this stuff and you guys have a sense for the convergence that's going on in our field. Much of what I've tried to make the biology, you know, in making the biology clear, I've talked about how the different directions, genetics, biochemistry, have converged together. What we're really seeing now is information science is converging with that as well. And I've got to say, it's a tremendous amount of fun. See you on Monday. Good luck on the quiz.